this is Brother Peter Diamond here with David Moore, and we were going to be having a debate about the papacy, and is it in Scripture? Does the Bible teach that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope? He's going to be arguing that the Bible does not teach that. I will be arguing the other side. So did you want to begin with a short opening statement? or? Um, yeah, it's, uh, any opening statement about the papacy... Uh is, is papacy is a very definitive issue. Obviously, without the papacy, there there isn't any Catholic Church as we know it, or have ever known it. So it's kind of a defining issue. But it also ties into the one true church thing because without that, it doesn't have the claim to the one true church. Um, obviously, there is one true church. The Bible says universally made up of all true believers, uh, collectively known as the church or the body of Christ. But uh, the Catholic Church has claimed to be that church. I think can be shown to be uh, false. Uh, according to the Catholic Church, one must follow only Peter and the apostles and their successors, and there isn't any salvation outside the Catholic Church, they say. Um, it should be pointed out earlier that the, the phrase, like Holy Mother Church and everything is, is that they use so much, is not found in Scripture at all. The, the only thing that's close to that is Galatians 4:26, where it says, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That's the only mother that the church has ever said to have uh, the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, not the church or not Mary or anything. I do hold that the church is invisible and not visible. Um, but I had a, let's see, uh, kind of a question about the one true church thing. Um, perhaps, yeah, make, you can make your statement and then we'll, uh, and we'll start with questions and stuff after that. Okay. Um... There is absolutely no doubt that St. Peter is the leader of the apostles. Um, the Bible is very clear about that, and the language which is used in the Bible shows that in many different ways. For instance, in every list of the twelve apostles, Peter's name is first, and Judas's name is last. This is true even though the order of the other apostles in between is not always exactly the same. And Peter was also not the first apostle called. Andrew was. And so Peter's always first, and Judas is always last. Additionally, in Matthew's list of the twelve apostles, Peter is not only named first, as he always is, but he's specifically identified as the chief, or the first, or the leader. In fact, the word there is protos, and that means first, or chief, or principal. And so Matthew, that literally means he's the chief of the tribe. And so Matthew's saying he is the chief, Peter. Additionally, the amount of times that his name is mentioned, he's, his name is mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. The next closest apostle is just 29. It's not even close. And then we look at some of the other examples of how his name is used throughout the gospel, throughout the Acts of the Apostles. And I'll just give a few quick examples. Like in Mark 16, 7, he says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. Okay, the language over and over again singles out Peter from the rest. It's the Apostles and Peter. Uh, Acts 2, 37. He said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Acts 5.29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, Mark 1.36. And Simon Peter and they that were with him. Okay, and then we look at, and we'll talk a lot about, I think, the main verses, uh, Matthew 16, where he gives the keys of the kingdom to heaven, or he says that he will give to St. Peter alone, even though all the other apostles are there, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. In John 21, 15 to 17, he entrusts his sheep, his whole flock, to St. Peter. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And the sheep, of course, are clearly the members of his church. And in Luke 22, he says that Satan has desired to sift all of the apostles. But I have prayed for you alone, St. Peter, that thy faith fail not. So those three huge, devastating examples or devastating verses to illustrate the point that St. Peter is the leader, he's the, the by the institution of Christ, the uh, leader of all the apostles, the head of his flock, by his institution, and then just a couple of other things I'll mention, and then I'll let you respond, that throughout the Acts of the Apostles, we see Peter's leadership in the church. For instance, the first Gentile convert, Cornelius, in Acts chapter 10, he's 
supernaturally instructed to go to St. Peter so that when this important event which would occur, which would show the universality of the church, he would be directed to the leader of the church. He was told to go to St. Peter. The vision that the old law's restrictions against unclean foods has ended, which we also read about in Acts 10, is given to St. Peter. It's a revelation, much like Jesus says that uh, God the Father revealed to him about uh, Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God. Clearly, St. Peter clearly has the primacy at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. He's the first one to speak. When he speaks, everyone is silent. Um, He meets out the discipline of the church in Acts 5 against Ananias and Sapphira and many other examples. So he's clearly the leader. And the last thing I'll say is that even Protestant scholars who have clearly dug into the text, um, even though they don't believe all the Catholic teachings about the papists, they admit there's no doubt that St. Peter is the leader of the apostles. So if you want to do a respond or, or you know, for a minute or two or... Well, yeah, well, you couldn't respond to all, you know, all of that because there are many scriptures and many points, but that's what we'll be going over sort of one at a time. Um, I did have a question, um, if you don't mind, about the, the one, it's just, it's a what do you think about this issue, and, and if you don't want to answer it, we'll just move on, but something that I've wondered about, um, the, uh, in <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, uh, Luke 49 and 59, uh, uh, John, an- um, John answered and said to Jesus, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. This, this sounds like the first Protestant. I mean, he was not with the visible church. He was going his own way. But why did Jesus tell his disciples not to forbid someone who was not with them? He, so he was not part of this visible one true church. I wonder if you had a, a thought about that, because it is a curious verse. Well, actually, there's a parallel passage in um, Matthew's Gospel, I believe it is, and I could probably find it pretty quickly, where it actually says the same thing but in a different way, which drives the point home more effectively, I believe, or more clearly for us. He says, he that is not with you is against you. Okay, and so if he's not against the doctrine of Christ, he is with you. And if you logically think about it, he that is not with you is against you, and then he, he that he is not against you is therefore with you. And so when you read that version of it, it seems to emphasize, well, these people aren't really with him, but he's actually not saying that. He's just saying that they're not in disagreement, they're not opposed to the teaching of Christ. And so I don't really, I don't really yeah, see any problem there. The, um, uh, in but how would that pertain to the papacy anyway? Well, it, it, it doesn't directly pertain to the papacy. It, is, it has to be, I don't know if there would be a whole topic for the, the true church. I just think that it kind of goes to, uh, speaks to the papacy because without following, because many popes have stated that one must be led by the sovereign pontiff, by the Roman pontiff, or else he cannot enter the sheepfold. And there are examples in Scripture where that simply isn't happening. Like um, Paul in uh, Philippians 1 says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction, and so forth. Um, uh, what then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. I was wondering, why would he rejoice about Christ being preached by wicked, envious people who are trying to afflict him, and certainly not lead him to the one true visible church, which would include Paul? And my answer to that would be, this is in an argument that of, against a visible church led by a visible head, that I would say, because the power of the gospel isn't hindered by the messenger. If it's preached correctly, as it no doubt has been many times, by false teachers and con men and, you know, Trinity Broadcast Network, I mean, they are all wolves in sheep's clothing, but I am sure that people have heard the gospel from them and believed, in spite of their wickedness, that the gospel itself has the power to save all who will believe. Uh, so I think that the need for a one visible church I don't think is scriptural. But well, to respond to that point, that I think that you're assuming that it's saying something which is not actually said. He says that they, out of contention, priest Christ not sincerely. Okay, he doesn't indicate that they're not part of the true church. They may just have less than perfect motives. And so yet people are finding out about the truth through what they're saying. Just like you might have some 
traditional Catholics, to use an analogy, who you know may not be of the best of intentions all the time, but some people might benefit from some of the things that they have to say because they are true. And so to assert that this means that he's justifying or endorsing the preaching of people who are absolutely separated from the church, I believe that's reading into it something that's not there. I don't know. He seems to be okay with the fact that the gospel is being preached, uh, whatever the motive might be, because I think it transcends the messenger. I think it's bigger than the vessel that uh, presents. Well, as long as the core truths are intact, yeah, I would I would agree that that's it's important for people to benefit from that, and that people can benefit from that, despite maybe less than uh, ideal intentions of the people who are always preaching it. So I don't really I don't see how that presents any problem. 